Welcome to the first ever episode of the Wild Ones podcast, where we talk about bike stuff. I am one of your hosts, Jimmy, and you are the other one. Francis. Francis. That's, that's Francis. That is me. Uh, in these podcasts, uh, we're going to look at news from the cycling industry, some controversial stuff that pops up from time to time, uh, a bit of behind the scenes with Cade Media, um, and also some questions and stories from you guys, the listeners. And before we get into that, how are you, Francis? How's your week been? Oh, I'm good, thanks. Oh, good. Yeah, what really you up good. To? I was at a wedding in Greece. Oh, were you? Photographs for people. Oh, yeah, I did know so that. I, I feel like I'm in recovery right now. From taking photos? No, is, not from the photos, from the beers. Is, is this your new line of work, wedding photographer? I could get into it. Depends how well this podcast goes. <laughs> good. So far, good. been a pain in the ass. You did, you did, well, the podcast or the wedding photos? Oh, uh, the podcast. The podcast. Mm. Why? But we'll get into that later. Okay. <laughs> um, I was actually having a conversation earlier this week with um, a cycling coach, Pete, um, about getting older and maintaining fit fitness. Um, I am in the latter stage of my 30s and I'm finding that getting fit and maintaining fitness and um, you could say weight as well, I guess, is significantly harder than when I was in my 20s. And then um, Emily decided to let me know that Garrett Thomas, who nearly won the Giro, has recently turned the same age as me. And that is quite upsetting. Which is 37? It is 37, yes. That's not that old. Well, I don't, I don't feel old. Well, I guess I do feel old. I don't think that 37 is old. It's However, true. things don't... Things just aren't as easy as they used to be. Do you think they got harder for Garrett Thomas? Um, I think he probably has certain things at his disposal that make it easier. Like coaches and nutritionists. <laughs> you could say that, yes. <laughs> so, let's move on to our first section. It is called The Debrief. Uh, in this section, we are going to chat about things that have gone on in the cycling world and at Cade Media lately. So the first one on the list is actually going back to the Giro. And the topic is Cav announces his retirement and then goes on to win the final stage oh. of the tour. It's kind of sad, but kind of happy. Which bit of it? Well, it's sad that he's retiring. But happy that he won. But obviously happy that he I won. Thought it could, but it could have been the other way. Happy that he's retiring, but sad that he won. Oh, he's out. <laughs> Probably should do it a couple more years. No, so he is... In his last year of being a pro now, he is tied with the amount of Tour de France stage wins as Eddie Merckx as the most stage wins ever from an, from an individual. And he's never said that he's going after that record, but everyone's putting lots of pressure on him to do so. This stage win at the end of the Giro, I think he had a crash a few days before as well, or you know, earlier on in the stage race, proves that he's on form. And it'll be very exciting to see if he can keep that form going through the Tour de France and pick up one win. So, he needs. so ultimately, he's after one win in the Tour. Well, I'm adding to the pressure by talking about it in this podcast. Mm. Sorry, Mark. I do like I do like Cav. He's got a thing about him. Yeah, it? me too. He's basically the reason I got into cycling. Was this? There was a film called Chasing Legends, which followed his team at the time, which was HTC High Road or HTC Columbia. Yes, it went through a it was, three, yeah. three diff, uh, few yeah. different um, it was like a white and yellow names, kit, wasn't it? White and yellow kit, mm. uh, and it was a year of the tour where he got nine stage wins at the at the end, Jesus. in total, which was crazy. They basically it was the first year where they started doing a lead out train, the first time any team has kind of done a really organised lead out train, which is now the dumb thing in cycling. There's like, everyone's got a lead out train, all the sprint teams, and yeah, that was that. If you haven't seen that film. Go and see that film. What was it called again? Chasing Legends. Chasing Legends. Yeah. Is it a film it, or a documentary? No, it's a film. It's a. It's a. Well, what's the difference? <laughs> but is it like? Is it fictional? No, no, no. It's a documentary. Right. Yeah, yeah. It covers, and it uses real world footage and like interviews with you know some of the commentators and people who know him. But it's quite a, a, an intense story arc for him because things don't start off that well. I just, I just realised. Spoilers now. Sorry. I just realised that Cav is thirty eight. And is also in great form, which is which is which is another reason that suggests that 
Uh, well, I... but this is people that look after themselves for their whole lives. They they are literally professional athletes for years and years and years. Are you saying I don't look after myself? You eat beige food ninety percent of the time. I eat leaves as well. You do the same as me, which is beige fake veggie chicken nuggets I... inside bread, I... maybe with some ketchup. Ketchup does not count as one of your five a day. I eat fish now though. Do you feel better? I do actually, because I'm because I need fingers. To... <laughs> yeah, highly processed fish fingers Perfect. instead of highly processed. Processed only. Not fish fingers. <laughs> For the listeners at home, we call this beige tapas. <laughs> <laughs> we do, yeah, we do. Right, oh, there's more news from uh, the Giro. Um, Geraint Thomas very famously wore Oakley racing jacket sunglasses forever. And I believe there was a that you couldn't even buy them. I think they changed the name though. I'm pretty sure they were called Jawbones when they first came out. It was a Jawbone. And then I think they had some sort of lawsuit and they had to change the name to Racing Jackets. That is his Jawbone suit off. them. Uh, pretty, yeah. I don't who 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 <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Um, That's definitely something along those lines happened. And yeah, he's so quite famously he was he has worn a very particular type of white sunglasses made by Oakley for a very large proportion of his career and this is the first season I believe that Sun God now sponsor the team that he's with mm -hmm. and Sun God have made an updated version I guess is the best way of saying it of his iconic sunglasses. It's a nod to it isn't it? A nod it's to a it. nod to it. Yeah. Oosh. Oosh. Do you know what they're called? Oh I know actually. GTs. Sun God GTs. Yeah. Oh, as in Garant Thomas, mm -hmm. not Gran Turismo. Mm -hmm. That's a great piece of marketing. Because so much of the chat was like, oh, it's not the same without G in his old glasses. Mm. And Sun God have just gone. There you go. Um, you are sponsored by Sun God. Mm -hmm. So it's probably best that you ask me what I think of them rather than what I, what you think of them. Because you are you going to be negative or are you positive? What do you think of them? I They're probably too big for my face. But I wouldn't have worn the original... Um, what are they called? Racing jackets. Uh, racing, the updated race, name. The, the proper jackets. name. Uh, I actually had a pair. I wore them a couple of times and I didn't actually like them that much. And I decided I didn't like them. That Where? The racing jackets? Yeah, the racing jackets one? years ago. Right, okay. Yeah. But you, had, you haven't worn the Sun God GTs though? No. Um, Only he has. I haven't seen any pairs. I asked Sun God. Did you? They were like, no, I'm not around yet. Apparently they were made using a 3D printer. I imagine nearly all of their glasses are made using 3D printers, no? What? Yeah. Really? Oh, 99% sure. No. CAD drawing, 3D printer. The 3D printing glasses? Like the frames? Wasn't it? That, that's just like how most plastic things are made now, no? Oh, I, I might be still, wrong. I, I, think, just... I think they'll still be using moulds. No, I guess so. It's, this, can, this can be the start of a new section called, um, <laughs> what do I call it? Uh, fiction or speculation? It's definitely no, speculation. Fact, fact or speculation? I don't know. We have, okay, so we have a friend. This is going way off topic already. This is great. Sorry, guys. First podcast. <laughs> Our friend Tom. Tom who? Lishman Walker. Oh, yes, yeah. He 3D prints things. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get him in trouble right now. <laughs> he 3D prints things. He like 3D prints Warhammer. And you just download the, the thing, like little the plastic final. models, if, you know, like um, Games Workshop models. Mm -hmm. And he... Yeah, pays for the file, downloads it, and then just 3D prints them. So if he can do that, surely uh, like a big scale production, I don't know, like Met Helmets, they 3D printed little Met Helmets when they were doing their... Little ones. What? Yeah, they're, like they're earrings. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's like the little test helmet. I'm, I'm going to call bullshit on this. No, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm very certain they are using like some kind of mold process. So you're saying they 3D printed his pair to make it quickly. Was that the point? I think I what I if here what I'm reading from just says using a 3D printer. So what I think happened was they probably uh, designed it and, and 3D printed a prototype for them to be able like, yep, this works, and then molded it. Cool. That's what I reckon. But again, and then they'll make some sort of mold. They all get made through production. there, and it's cheaper. Yeah, because there's like a thousand being made. But of course, I have absolutely no idea whether this is fact or speculation. Great. How informative. <laughs> Right, the next piece of news, not the Giro this time, it is about Campag. Um, they are ditching the thing that I absolutely love about Campag. 
they're going to get rid of the thumb shifters and are going wireless. I guess that would just be replaced by buttons in that case. But you also love wireless shifting. That or you love electric shifting, yeah. which we discovered in a video the other day, mm. as we all do. Um, so it's going to be, it's a 12 speed super record wireless group set and it's going to cost, are you ready for this? I can see it on my screen. It's, that is a shame battle, isn't offensively it? offensively expensive. I mean, Campag have always had the most expensive group set for a long time. And now they are still the most expensive. £4,200. No. £4,500. Yeah. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Up, like... I've had questions in the comments before about there are quite a few people pointing it out that we don't ever have any Campag on the channel. Right. And people were speculating whether it's like, is it a sponsored thing? Is it because we're, you know, in cahoots with SRAM and Shimano? And like, I used to be sponsored by Shimano years ago, like four years ago. Since then, no connection whatsoever. But we still only have SRAM and Shimano on the channel because it's on everybody's bikes. I haven't come across anyone except for James Thomas, because I think he had Campag on his old steel custom built frame. Like Autumn Frameworks. Made by a guy called Trevor. Oh, they're amazing. Really cool. I met him once at Yeah, spoke. and he had uh, some Campag on there, but he took it off when we ended up doing a big ride on it because he wasn't confident that he could get replacement parts. Yeah. So that goes to show how few bits of Campag there are. I would love to have some Campag on the channel. If anyone's listening from Campag, <laughs> test it. We're we not going to buy that, are we? No. <laughs> is it, is Even it, 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 special it, trade prizes are going to be expensive. It would be great to see what that's like against a SRAM Red group set, which is about a grand the cheaper, mm. which we actually made a video of recently. And I like the, and even then it felt like, you know, three thousand, three and a half thousand pounds for a group set was like in just, just wild. And then that's a grand again. But I guess the interesting thing from our perspective as video makers is that's going to make it very easy for us to get to like a 20,000 pound bike. Because we love putting together really expensive bikes. Well, I'm not even saying that we would, we would like, buy it and build it but like it would be pretty cool to ride a twenty thousand pound bike and be like is this worth twenty thousand well i already know the answer the answer is no, no. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just it would be be quite cool. Cool. i think it's good like they definitely they for the move to from my understanding from their move to electric they were always a little bit behind the curve whether it's because of patents or whatever the they had to have cables running all the way through the frame still like wires running all, all the way through the frame still like shimano. and the ports well shimano is like semi isn't it semi wireless still. goes in between the chain states still lots of cables campag had all of them and the ports the, the the end of the cable is quite big so it's what nick was moaning about um before they don't fit through the holes of frames very well and it just didn't it wasn't quite as good as the sram and shimano offerings however it had its benefits campag wears in Bro, you know, Shimano wears out, all of that stuff. It looks really nice. People were going to buy it for their Italian bikes. There's always going to be a market, a smaller market for it. But I think they were doing all right. And clearly, you know, perhaps this will be uh, a thing which trickles down to their cheaper group sets. Then are they just doing Super Record? Do you know? So it looks like Super Record Wireless is going to replace the existing Super Record EPS. Yeah. And I think it's going to be disc only. Okay. So that's in line with Shimano as well for the top end group sets. Actually, yeah, every, that, and the same with SRAM, isn't it? Oh, actually, no, you can't. No, you can't get. It. You can get SRAM. Uh, I got Force rim brake. Yeah, I think there's a SRAM Red rim brake at the moment. But the new Force, the one you filmed, the release of that's disc only. Disc only, yeah. really? Okay, so I've got the well, last I, version of. Uh, I'm rim. pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah, sure yeah. it is. I think you might don't quote me on that. That's mm. possible speculation. <laughs> We just come up with a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's de it's uh, there's definitely some kind of movement happening right now from manufacturers. Like rim brakes are legit being filtered out. I don't know if that's one we want to cover for another time because that's that's a that's a, a big conversation. I think. But what this does suggest is manufacturers are clearly starting to think about disc brakes only. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next section. Next yes. section, I feel like you are more qualified to talk about than I am. Because <laughs> you are this. Uh, You're on that side. You were. Or still are. Still am. Yeah. So the cycling industry is struggling. Or 
as Emily has put in the notes, in turmoil. Yeah. Not a word I would usually use, but I'm not sure. <laughs> turmoil. Expanding the vocabulary. That's lovely. <laughs> yes. The cycling industry in turmoil. Is it? Um... There's been distributors shutting down. The more large shut down. I heard about that because people were like, oh, oh my, I, can't, gonna, I won't be able to get hold of Lake shoes anymore, oh, which they, James oh, stops. Yeah. James actually buys them direct from Lake. So don't worry, never fear. James's shop in Richmond is going to always have millions of pairs of shoes. Well, I think, I think Lake pretty much instantly set up direct distribution in the UK. Yeah, yeah. I think well, they, they, they were doing some of it anyway. They were doing some of it anyway. Yeah. Uh, whether that was just to James or not, but that's, they'll be fine. Um, I don't know what other brands. So, so ul ultimately, in this section, what we are looking at is More Large, which is a humongous UK distribution company, uh, went into administration with thirty-five million pounds of the stock. Another distributor called Two Pure uh, has presumably gone into administration as well. Uh, clothing brand Machines for Freedom, which I don't think they're British. Are they British? I don't know them. Do we know if they're British? I, I'm not sure. Oh, were they? So machines, Machine for Freedom were, are an American brand that were apparently bought by Specialized and have sub subsequently been shut down. Miltag is another British brand that used to do a lot of custom um, and have shut down. Then there's also Velo. So Velo Vixen went, went into liquidation and were bought by Stolen Goat. Uh, ultimately, there's a lot of businesses, big and small, um, that are having or are definitely having challenges at the minute. Uh, a decent number of them are clothing brands as well, actually. You run a clothing brand called Atticus. I do. Has that been difficult over the last couple of years? What's been the situation there? Yeah, I think I think uh, I think we actually are quite lucky that we are good at analysing the market and reacting to it. So we made the decision last year to start reducing how much stock we have rather than increasing how much stock we have. So I think a lot of what's happening at the minute is lots of cycling businesses got very, exci very excited even by the boom that was happening with COVID restrictions. Uh, everyone then wanted to buy more and more stock, partly because they couldn't get it. So it was, it was thought of, well, if I buy more, then I've, I've at least got it. Um, and definitely then we've started moving into people buying less stuff. You know, there's a lot more um concern about what's going to happen with just everyday people you know am i have i still got a job um how much are things going to cost can i afford my energy bills there's a lot of reason why people wouldn't want to spend loads of money now or would be more cautious about how they're spending money and that's obviously going to impact businesses that have bought a lot of stock and therefore need specifically need to sell lots of product mm -hmm. um we uh we were quite fortunate that we decided to start reducing or, or taking a step or moving our position into a healthier place the end of last year uh, we then found out the towards the end of last year that our factory that we've used for about five or six years in Italy is being shut down by the owners uh, we then started um, developing our models with another factory uh, which used to make a lot of kit for the parent company of Castelli and Sportiful um, they've been told that those brands are not buying anymore because they've got so much stock and therefore that sh factory is now closed down as well. Uh, fortunately, we know another one which, which is going to be fine. Um, but ultimately, you know, especially in the clothing space, there's a lot of businesses with stock and they're stopping to buy stuff and therefore the manufacturing is starting to choke up. Um, I think Miltag talked quite a bit about Brexit issues. Um, it, there definitely were a lot of challenges with, with Brexit and being a British brand and buying stuff from overseas. You found stuff post, posting things out has been a pain in the ass, hasn't it? Well, yeah. The, the, well, the biggest issue with the Brexit thing is that just costs went just quadrupled in terms of like importing stuff. Yeah. Um, so actually just getting stock to this country, the cost of it just became like huge, huge, huge. Um, there's, the, we, we found ways to navigate it. Um, I don't think Brexit is, has had much as much of an impact as covid mm -hmm. in terms of like how it's affected supply and 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 how consumers are spending money your factory was getting like shutting down if one person got covid right uh and there were periods where it was like oh okay everyone's just gone for well with however many weeks with yeah with italy 
all manufacturing in Northern Italy completely shut down with with part of COVID, and like it didn't operate for like a couple of months. Um, and I think that maybe created like an artificial de demand. Everyone wanted to buy stuff, um, which has then boosted things. When people were like, there was furlough going on and things like that, and then people did have did want to spend money on things. Mm -hmm. It was before we started feeling the effects of it. Yeah, I think we have seen the start of probably a lot more businesses struggling over the next 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we'll probably see, I, I guess from a consumer's perspective, what you might see is some some good deals popping up. Like for example, More Large went into dis, into administration with 35 million quids worth of stock, and then all of that has ended up on auction. So, Oh, people were picking up lake cheap. Well, exactly. Yeah, if 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 there's if they if if someone goes into administration, the chances are you're going to be able to get some of their products for cheap. Just a small silver lining. Yeah. Specialized alley, entry level of what used to be entry level is now disc brake only. The new version. What do you think of that? Um, I had a specialized alley as my first proper road bike, and it was phenomenal. Yeah. And then I once, much later on imported a specialized LA sprint do you remember it yeah because you it was it was like a flip paint like a blue and purple flip paint mm -hmm. and it wasn't available in this country as a colorway so I had to convince a shop in America to sell it to me and send it over which they're technically not meant it's to like do. it's like the purple yes similar yeah, yeah that yeah. was cool and you know that with Duraace on and everything Dur yeah that the was sprint was weird but I mean it was weird. why why because they sold that as well everybody talked about it as a crit bike yeah. They were like, this is a crit, like an aluminium crit bike. And everyone's obsessed with aluminium as a crit bike. But it doesn't really make sense because if you crash aluminium and you really... Like, it's actually a write-off, it, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas, whereas you well, can repair You can carbon. ride it with a dent, admittedly. But if you crack it, there's a carbon you can repair. And steel, well. obviously, as well. Steel? Well, yeah, you can oh, repair oh, steel. Yeah. And steel. Like <laughs> st <laughs> steel it. Uh, yeah, steel as well. You could, like, re-weld stuff. So, really, it's the worst material for a crit bike? Well, at current prices, yes. Yeah. Historically, it was way cheaper. Than, it, yeah, it was. That yeah. was that was it. You know, you used to be able to get a lighter bike that was stiff and solid, but it would be you know six hundred quid for a frame set rather than. 12. I guess things have changed. Like if you bought a Planet X, a carbon Planet X, or an Elves, or whatever, the cheap carbon now is so good, you might as well have that as your crit bike. There's no reason to get buy an aluminium bike because of the price, because you can get stuff which is really cheap. Cheap carbon is really good. Cheap carbon is now cheaper than not than alloy, isn't it? Yes. Big big brand alloy. Mm -hmm. Which obviously there's an environmental aspect to consider. But if you're buying carbon bikes, you're buying carbon bikes. So what you're saying is, instead of buying an alloy now, you would just buy a cheap carbon frame. Um, no, because if I was going to buy, well, it depends who I was. If I was getting into cycling as a newbie, we know that the big manufacturers are making the, only the very top end of entry level bikes. They're starting at £800, £900, or in this case, is this the cheapest alloy they do? £1,100. Let's see. Uh, so the outgoing rim brake model uh, is the most affordable option at £1,000, which is the LA E5. Uh, it features Shimano Claris drive train and Tektro rim brake. That's the old one. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, 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 the new one is thousand. now £1,100 for the cheapest bike they do. Yeah. So it's so it's an LA disc. It's £1,100. Uh, it gets the same Claris group set uh, and mechanical Tektro disc brakes. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. It's not entry level at all. It isn't, that isn't really an entry no. level bike, is but it? But that's like, it's... Um, well, it isn't, it isn't, it absolutely isn't. What group said do you get on it? Claris. With Tektra brake. Oh, okay, so it's the middle rung of... That is going to be a very good bike. Oh, no, it's not. Claris really is low. Yeah. Claris uh, is... They're, 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 Shimano consider that, uh, like, um, recreational level group set. It's, it's STI shifters, though, isn't it? Yeah. So, so in terms of its performance... Yes, it's relatively low in the Shimano scheme of things, but what we know is that group set. Oh, it's really pretty well. Yeah, yeah, because there's everything. It's got reach adjustment. It has SCI shifters where everything's controlled in your hands. It looks similar. It's you know, being to, to the normal road bike group sets. Specialized are referring to it as the lightest frame in its class, with the frame claimed weight for a 56 centimeter as 1.4 kilograms. 
1.375 apparently. So the frame is fairly l light, but the total bike is still going to be quite heavy if, with Claris with disc brakes. Uh, well, yeah, with disc brakes, because obviously disc brakes are heavier than rim brakes, it's going to probably be uh, eight and a half, nine and a half kilo bike. Mm, but I bet it's over nine. But, well, we know for a fact that if it's, it doesn't matter. If it's under 10 kilos, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ride well. I think that's a really good bike. It's a lot of money. It feels weird that they're getting rid of rim brakes on what has always been their, like, entry level, you know? Like, yes, 600 pounds 10 years ago was actually quite a lot of money and is probably about that price now. Um, but it always felt like you were getting good value for money with an old Alley. Specialised Alley was always, like, that's a banging bike you're going to get and it's not going to cost you the world. Whereas, I don't know, a thousand, well, 1,100 pounds, that's a lot of money, isn't it? It's just not entry level. But it's not up to those brands to be, well, not up to them. They've decided to not make a truly entry level bike anymore. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it, now, as we know, having tested a few of these bikes on video, there's great things. You can just go to Decathlon. The tri-bands are amazing. Halfords even, the, okay, the setup wasn't great that they did on it and the handlebars are a bit funny shape. Other than that, Brilliant bike for five hundred pounds. Did we pay five forty? Um, yeah. Do you think that manufacturers are using hydraulic brakes as an excuse to increase prices? Well, that's not even hydraulic brakes. It is no. It is, it is hydraulic. No hydraulic. No. Alice board. Yeah, the bottom. The the one thousand one pound. The one thousand one hundred pound specialized alley is mechanical disc brakes. Oh, it's mechanical. Yeah. Oh, the. Oh my God! So the hydraulic one is one thousand six hundred pounds. Yeah. Oh my God! If that other one came with hydros, it would be a pretty good deal. Well, yeah, that's but what like I'm mechanical thinking. disc brake. Like, I know some people are like, yeah, they, there are good ones, and if they're set up really well, some of the cheaper ones are okay as well. But then equally, you talk to some people, and they're like, nah, they should be illegal. Like they're 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 squishy and not very nice, and nowhere near as good. If you spent the same money on a rim brake system, it would be really nice. This, like, it feels like this should be a rim brake bike. This is what we said about the other it's, bike the other day in the video. Well, I just true. like, yeah, a lot of things should be rim brake. This does this. This feels odd to me. I'm disappointed. Oh. I am disappointed. Oh, that sixteen hundred pound bike should be the eleven hundred pound bike. Mm. End of an era. Yeah, but again, if you're a newbie, if you're a newbie. Are you even going to stretch that amount of money? Probably not. Will people, if they want the specialised name, pay it? Probably. But there are loads of good other options. There are. Mm -hmm. Right, next. A decathlon fanboy. Who are you? Yeah, I just <laughs> love it. They walk around there all day. They do have some good stuff. Um, the next thing, I don't know very much about, but I feel like you know more than me. So Netflix is soon to launch a Tour de France documentary, I believe it is, called Unchained. Um, they've already commissioned it for a second season, which means that they're basically saying that it's going to be a banger. Um, and the first one hasn't even aired yet. It comes out on June 8th, which is that, that's quite clever, isn't it? That's, that's like leading. That's basically the couple of weeks before the tour starts when people are starting to get a bit of fever for it and you get a highlight of the previous year or whenever it was filmed. Mm -hmm. What do you know about this series? Because I don't know that much about it. Um, they follow a few teams. So there was camera crews following a few different bike teams during last year's Tour de France. So like Jumbo Visma, uh, UAE maybe. Um, I think they had, you know, they were following the teams that had chances at stage wins and the overall classification. Yeah. I'm excited to watch it. I've, I used to watch pro cycling. It's why I got into bike racing and around that time when I was, you know, racing it every week and watching it all the time and it was brilliant and I've sort of lost track of it now just because I'm doing other stuff. If this is done well, like Drive to Survive, which is the F1 uh, Netflix series that has been really popular, if it's done in that style and it's about bikes, I'm in. Have you watched the F1 one? The first episode, yes. Why only the first episode? Because you got bored of it. I didn't have time. No, I didn't get bored of it. It was really good. And I, 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 I know it takes a few episodes to get into because F1 
I don't know anything about F1 and there's a lot to learn. Oh, F1's great. Yeah, yeah. It's, I could get, come back around. I could get into it. I it it like... used to be great in the 90s. I used to watch it all the time with my grandfather. Then I grew up and got bored of it and it got boring, but yeah. it's like, it's exciting again. Yeah. Racing is racing. It should work. The format should work for this. And there's loads of good personalities. I know for a fact, I didn't watch the Tour de France last year, but I caught some of the highlights and some of the news yeah. and I know it was crazy. I... Uh... Probably people don't expect this of me, mm. but I do not have any interest in pro cycling whatsoever. I couldn't even tell you who won the tour last year. Mm -hmm. Who did win the tour last year? Uh, Chris Froome. Oh, I've forgotten his name. Bradley Wigan. <laughs> I literally, th this goes to show how little we watch pro cycling. <laughs> uh, Vinegard, Vinegarden, his name is. No idea who yeah. that is. Never heard yeah. of him. So it was like. Boccaccia and Vinegard and they were having a head-to-head -head and it was very, very close and very exciting. I've heard of from the Boccaccia. News. He's young, isn't he? Yeah. He won the last year. The year yeah, before. super young with a little tuft coming out of his helmet. Yeah. But there's also, you know, even in the individual stages, there was some really cool stuff going on. So this documentary, if done correctly with loads of money from Netflix, could bring me back into watching pro cycling and I would like that to happen. So, so I've so watched... I'd be, be obsessed with it and have something to watch. I, I'm... I'm not much of a sports fan in terms of watching it. I do like watching some sports, uh, just I'm not like hardcore into it. Mm -hmm. I have watched the football equivalent of uh, a series that follows Sunderland for an entire season, Sunderland Football Club. I've been there. Um, another one which follows Man City and another one which follows Wrexham, now owned by Ryan Reynolds, famously. And weird, what's that all about? Sorry, carry on. Money. We'll talk about, we'll about Ryan Reynolds in a minute. Um, and those series is Siri, Siri series is mm. are amazing. I really enjoyed them. Cool. Um, which makes me think, assuming that they make this to the same scale, exactly like you're saying, I actually am quite looking forward to it. Yeah, anything can be, if it's done well, anything like video documentary wise podcast. can be on pretty podcast <laughs> can be on any topic and if it's done well enough yeah. it will get viewers so I don't know this could be fantastic if it becomes as popular as Drive to Survive unlikely but even if it has half the success of that it's going to be brilliant for more people getting into cycling I hope and therefore make cycling outside nicer because people will be like oh yeah it's that thing yeah you know from Netflix I, have you done much riding in France yeah loads what I love about riding in France is all of the French are madly in love with cycling. So yeah, so they beep you out. They, well, exactly, it's friendly yeah. beeps rather than uh, nasty ones. They, they'll give you. They'll like. They'll literally be like shouting "Allez!" out the window whilst they're like blasting past you with loads of space. They'll never. They'll never buzz past you, and it's like all over Europe is that, isn't it? It's great. Actually, yeah, it is, isn't it? And it's it's such a nice. It makes me happy when that happens. Mm -hmm. I wish it was like that in this country. So if if programs like this can help that change happen give it a chance of being a bit more mainstream and being people going like actually cycling is kind of cool mm -hmm. then brilliant more of it please yes please keeping an eye oh this is controversial <laughs> have you seen what's next on the agenda yeah i've seen yeah um this is again definitely one for you to talk about pro bikes are made of different stuff to mass market bikes so this is basically talking about the carbon layup of professional bikes versus the stuff that you can actually buy off the shelf. Yeah. So shout out here to Chris and Jesse who have a cycling podcast called The Nero Show and they actually talked about this in a podcast the other day. Um, they <laughs> we have a friend called Rob and I went and did some filming with him and he is a carbon repair expert who sees a lot of professional and consumer bike frames every single day he has to he doesn't have to chop them up he he inevitably ends up seeing inside the frames to repair them and i have a very long clip of him that i took on my video camera which we haven't used for a video yet and this was months ago uh about his opinion on whether the frames that you can buy in shops from some brands being the same ones that are being raced in the tour de france now, the UCI have a rule that anything being used for professional competition has to be available for purchase 
to consumers. It's a bit of a gray area though, and that's not done properly at all. And there's loads of stuff that people are racing in, that pros are racing in, that isn't available and will never be in stock, that kind of thing. You know, there's like a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a minefield. However, in this section, we're specifically talking about the frames that they're riding. Yes. What are you going to say? So, I guess the angle that you're talking about this means, suggests that perhaps some teams are actually cheating because they probably, presumably the whole point of them having different carbon or different carbon layups is that it's actually stiffer, better, better for racing, therefore yeah, yeah. faster. Well, I guess it's not going to be more aerodynamic because it's probably the same profile, same shape. but it'll at least be, it's probably about stiffness, isn't it? So they're getting better power. In terms transfer. of the frames, yes. In terms of like actual products, no. Some people, some, there are, uh, you know, the hour record has been done on bikes, which, which is under UCI ruling has been done on bikes and pieces of equipment like chain rings and things like that that are just not available for purchase even though they technically are because they're on a website that says Sold out of stock out. yeah right. so it's just it's a bit of a weird rule i guess there's two ways of looking at this from a consumer perspective it doesn't make a difference because you don't need that same carbon well, layer but, as a pro yeah okay from a pro's perspective it could be cheating Potentially, I guess. So the big question uh, and the bit that I want to get onto is if you're a consumer, do you want the bike that is being raced at the Tour de France? And after speaking to Rob, I would safely say no. Oh, I don't want that because it's a crap product. Why? What does that mean? How? So he is convinced that some manufacturers, the frames that they'll be racing at pro level are made because he's repaired them bear in mind that he's had people come in from pro cycling teams to have their frames or their riders frames repaired and he's like this is so he the term he used was dry so there's a lack of resin being used when the frames are being built that creates a stiffer product and a lighter product um, I need to go and look over exactly what there was one main benefit it was either stiffness or, or lightness I can't remember I need to go back and watch the clip um, well, the, the, it, it, but in, in turn that makes the frames extremely brittle which means if you went and did up your bolts and you know assembled your bike without a torque wrench which everyone does if you're doing any home mechanics you know people do that kind of thing the bikes are extremely fragile and are more likely to break Therefore, it's not a very good consumer product, is his argument. So in actual fact, it's not really at the detriment to the consumer, mm -hmm. but it is dishonest and a bit weird. I, I, just, it get, I get a weird vibe from it. Like, if there's a rule that says you have to, you know, the rule is potentially like, being broken by some teams. Like the rule which also says no drugs. <laughs> Topic for another time. Oh, all of this is alleged. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. All of this is led. I mean, I'm only regurgitating here what Rob has told me. We, we, yeah, for legal reasons, we don't know this is fact, but we're. Is what Rob said. Is what Rob said. Yeah, fact or speculation. We'll go with speculation. We'll go with speculation. But it may be fact, but it's speculation definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, he did say, however, that's not the case with all brands. And obviously, we're not going to be naming names here. It's not the case with all brands. Well, there is actually um, a specific name on the list that you were going to talk about. The specific about. name on the list is, is interesting <laughs> uh, because he said, not to the same extent of the pro bikes, but all canyons that he has in for repair are very dry. So they use not that much resin. But that's all consumer bikes. That's all the, like, I don't know if he's done any pro ones, but particularly the consumer bikes compared to other manufacturers, they're very dry frames. So if you have a canyon, make sure you use a torque wrench. I thought you were going to say, make sure you, I don't know, like lubricate the frame because it's dry. That's <laughs> Moisturize. It sounds weird, doesn't it? Yeah. But he just means how much resin is being used in the frame. So when he, when he chops them up, there's a thing. I would urge you to subscribe to this YouTube channel or if you're on Spotify right now, go to YouTube, type in Cade Media and subscribe because there'll be a future video talking about this topic with Rob, the expert. And similarly, if you're watching this on YouTube, go to Spotify and subscribe to the podcast. <laughs> is that how you do that? Is it subscribe? I don't know. No, follow. follow. I think it's follow, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Or whatever other podcast platform you are using. Mm, iTunes and all that. Fuck up of the week. 
this is going to be where we talk about the thing that we cocked up the most this week. The thing we cocked up the most. Yeah. Because there's guaranteed going to be one every single week. The YouTube channel we have is called Cade Media, and we make videos about bikes. Bikes require a lot of... Bike videos require a lot of thought, and there's things that go wrong all the time. There really are. Like so many things. Most days. Most days. It's usually stuff that goes missing. For example, memory cards. Fuck up of the week this week is memory cards. Oh, we we have... We probably own a total of about 12 memory cards. All of them, apart from one of mine. Have you, no, have you got two cards now? I think I have two, yeah. You now have two cards because yeah. I made you buy a second. Yeah, one. I used to make vlogs, mate. So a lot of my cards have been donated to Cade Media. Thank you. So that we can move things around. Um, we have two card readers, or two card holders even. One at the studio, one at your house, because you always edit at home. Mm-hmm. Bearing in mind that this normally has some somewhere around 10 cards in it. You came into work the other day. We went to film and shoot some thumbnails. And we discovered that there were zero cards at the studio. They're like, there must be five cameras here. A yeah. studio full of bike and camera equipment and not a single memory card. Not a single one. That was pretty stupid. And annoyingly, they're super specialist memory cards. Well, to shoot, so the videos that we post on the main channel are shot in 4K, which is quite high resolution, 10-bit S-log, so a log profile, so it's all like low contrast and means you get loads of information in the image and it looks better. But doing that, you have to use really expensive really fast memory cards. Mm-hmm. So we're talking like 200, 250 pounds for a memory card. Yes. And that's expensive. We don't, we didn't want to have to buy another one of those in town. We didn't. So we had to go on a wild goose chase in order to be able to stick to the video schedule because there is one, despite how lovely and fun it looks. Sometimes <laughs> videos are quite difficult to make. Uh, so yeah, fortunately we borrowed one off Nick, which I think was actually a card that one of us gave to him. And it wasn't well. fast enough. Which is why all the B-roll in the video that we did, B-roll being the slow motion shots of the bikes and products and things that we have in the videos, none of it could be shot in slow motion. So I had to stand there really carefully with the camera and move it super, 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 super slow. And I posted a story on Instagram of you of me, yeah. stink, stank face. No, the face makes you more stable. Stank face. Yeah. Your stank face is like, you know, when, when, you, when you're listening to metal music and, you're, and like the big metal riff drops and you're like, oh, that's what you were calling it. What's, what's de gent? Gent. 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 Is that what it is? It's a, t- it's a type of yeah. metal. Yeah. That's the face I would do if I was playing gent. Gent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stank face. Bit niche. It's very niche. <laughs> All I'm saying is the face helps and I'm holding my breath to do it. Anyway, second fuck up of the week. <laughs> For the listeners at home, I am now <laughs> looking very angrily at the backdrop. There's one million, probably close to one million, maybe two million foam squares that we have stuck to the walls of this small room inside our big studio. And we have covered probably 80% of the walls with these foam things. We stick these on the wall with carpet glue, which is like... Psh- spray spider-man style glue yeah spider-manning it and we came in today thinking we had done a fantastic job set up the cameras set up the lights two cameras all of this stuff emily's here our producer we're all ready to shoot and this is the last chance we can shoot this podcast before i go away for a week and a bit so we had to get this done today otherwise the things that we're going to be talking about it's not news anymore Mm -hmm. so we're under pressure and then as soon as we spoke there was a frequency which sounded, well, can you describe it? Uh, it basically sounded, yeah. All of our audio was ruined. It was, it was a, an unexpected one frequency echo rolling around the room whilst we were talking. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, was, it just stresses me out thinking about it. Well, I guess, I guess it doesn't. It sounds silly. This is, but we've been planning this all morning and you get down and you're ready to go. And then you're sat here and there's just a weird noise and we and we're, we're there. We don't know how to fix it. We're not sound guys. Well, how are we supposed to do that? We can. We, we do have a method for fixing it, i.e. why when you're listening to this, it is going to sound amazing. Mm. But it requires post. Post edit processing, 
which is just an, a step that we were trying to avoid. I just made loads of weird noises. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. of weird, weird like duck, like one of those. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and that made it up. So, but ult ultimately, we can process this audio, which we will do for this video. Uh, but what I can tell you is, in the room, it doesn't sound as good. <laughs> doesn't sound as good. The big question of the week. What is it? Uh, each episode, we'll pick a cycling-related question to debate. These questions will often be inspired by recent videos we've made, big news stories, uh, or by the things that cause beef in the comments. Oh, uh, so much beef. I know what this question is. I know, we do. Yeah. <laughs> so the big question we're going to look at this week is... Why are we all so obsessed with bike weight? Oh my goodness. It is without a doubt the most commented theme on the Cade Media channel, and the Jimmy Media channel on the bike build videos that I do, everyone is clearly obsessed with how much bikes weigh. Do you want to know why? Yes, please. It's the only quantifiable thing you can compare with other people about your bike. Like, it's the only measurable thing. What? So you basically... In terms of, like... There's no... You, lightest a car dick has, like... The f <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did say that. <laughs> lightest dick competition. Is that what you're saying? Uh... I don't understand all that. <laughs> if you have a car, you can go, my car has a top speed of this. If you have a bike, what are you going to do? You're going to take it to a wind tunnel and measure it. But then that doesn't matter because if you're sat on your bike, you're going to be different aerodynamic. Like you'll have a different CDA than someone sat on your bike who looks is a different shape to you. The only thing you can measure is weight. But why does it matter? Technically, a lighter bike is faster. Whoa, 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 whoa. So, so for, oh my God, I, can't, I don't even, want, go, I don't even want to debate this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this is just too broad. No, I don't think we are debating. I was purely playing devil's advocate there. There's, there is no, it completely depends what kind of ride you're doing, firstly. If you're, if you're purely looking at performance, then a lighter bike will be faster if you're riding from a, the bottom of a hill to the top of a hill. If the ride goes back down the other side, aerodynamics probably trump weight. Okay. And that's what your focus should be on. I'm going to ask my question again. What's Why does question? it matter? It doesn't matter. Exactly. It it's doesn't. not important. And what we have learned over the last couple of weeks, because we specifically in the last couple of weeks have ridden bikes from sub seven kilos to sub 16 kilos. And if the bike is under 10 kilos, you don't notice a difference. Technically, you might be slower than a different bike. A little bit, a little bit. You, you'll get like a, a real, a real from stopped, from a complete standstill, accelerating a seven kilo bike and getting up to speed versus a 10 kilo bike and getting up to speed. I could notice that difference. It'd be like, oh, this bike feels really good. But once you're at speed. I've ridden nine and a half kilo bikes that feel really good. Mm -hmm. But I'm not looking at how fast it is. Yeah. Stop looking at, stop looking at performance. Performance isn't important. Perform Performance isn't important unless you're a professional cyclist or you're legitimately competing. So there is probably a good argument for triathletes to look for speed. Mm -hmm. But as we know, it's probably actually more likely to be aerodynamics than it is uh, weight. I'm going to read some comments from videos that we have posted. Um, so from the video on Cade Media where you weighed a load of people's bikes at Sea Otter. These are three comments from that video. Uh, why are road... Oh, wow, this is literally capitals with lots of uh, punctuation after it. Why are, ro why are road bikes so heavy now? Um, and then another one saying, weighing bikes without pedals should be illegal. Or oh, like... A bit extreme. Clearly what that demonstrates is that people are very passionate about weight. Uh, I've got a couple more comments. This is from one of the bike build videos on my channel. It is a time bike with SRAM Red and Zip Wheel. So it's top end bike. Um, SRAM Red plus 353 NSW, I'm assuming that's the type of zip wheels. Mm. No pedals and bottle cages, yet still weighs 7.3 kilos. Big yikes. Still looks good though. 7.3 kilos for a bike and someone thinks that that's heavy. Well, I can, people are coming from, there's like the weight weenie guys, right? 
and they're looking they 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 are building bikes for hill climbs which are just impractical to ride and they're like five kilos but that isn't what these people are these are just normal people this is normal people that are thinking that 7.3 kilo bike is heavy based on the spec of it mm. uh one more here from actually the same build video um oh no this is actually from my bike my pink time bike which weighs 8.4 kilos and the comment was you are calling this a climbing bike look at the weight of it like 8.4 kilos is very light for a bike with tubeless wheels set up with sealant disc brakes like i don't i don't i don't quite get why everyone is that with pedals as well uh i can't remember probably not Oh, you're about to say it's a heavy bike, aren't you? Man, I don't, it's not that light. You're far the from not that light. Um, but it, it's it's when you're just looking at the number, it's like, oh, that's a, that might be a heavy bike. But it is, in terms of the feel, and when you actually go and ride it, as a total percentage of your weight, when you've got shoes, kit, helmet, glasses, phone in your pocket, all of this stuff, it's such a small deal. Like, if it really made that much difference... I wouldn't have finished. I would still be cycling across America now if it really made a difference. Well, like, yeah, because my total, total setup, 50, 20, 50 kilos. Five zero. Yeah, I had a trailer on the back of, course, of my bike. Yeah. <laughs> and we were climbing like 2,000 meters some days. Yeah. Like I wouldn't have got over the climbs if it really made that much difference. But yeah. if you think about it, like a, I'm pretty light. 60. Seven yeah. kilos? You don't, I don't know. I'm probably heavier than I used to be. But, uh, there's, you know, me with a fully laden bike, call it 30 kilos, when it's my normal bike packing setup with all my laptop and camera and all that crap for filming videos, that is still less than 100 kilos. But there are riders who weigh 120, 130, which on their own. And they still get around and go fast. I huh? think... Um... I kind of feel like... like... Obi, big bodybuilder guy. How much does he weigh? Oh, he's 110. Yeah, well, Will Girling as well. He's, yeah, Will Girling. He's a... He's a be, he's, he'd be, but he's not slow. He's super fast. I think... And he's not doing... And that, he doesn't have, like, unlimited power. He's not super strong. Neither of those guys are cardio, like, mega strong. But they still go fast and well, fast enough. They still cover ground. Well, I th it just doesn't make that I, much difference. I think the, I, I th I think the point is that fast doesn't mean anything and therefore weight also doesn't mean anything it's like what are most people doing when they ride their bikes they're like you know going out and having some fun with their mates or commuting or whatever mm. Where, whether that's that bike is five kilos or seven kilos or nine kilos or 10 kilos or 12 kilos it doesn't actually make that much difference you're still going to get the ride done as long as the bike works and arguably you've got a, a suitable gear range for your level of fitness um I guess people like to think, there's a lot of people who like to think they are competing, whether it's for a, well, they are competing for a, for a Strava KOM or something like that. And having that thing to focus on, like, oh, I've shaved off some grams here. I've made, I've, I've quantifiably made a difference to the time I'm going to do on this Strava segment because I've shaved off some weight on my bike. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But And it's, it's like, cool. But don't push it onto other people and be like, that bike's heavy when really they're all light bikes unless you're buying the thing from walmart we bought the other day like yeah like if if you are a wealthy person and you want to pay a premium for a very light bike that's absolutely fine cool mm -hmm. like excellent you've got a really cool bike but it's it, you hit the nail on the head there and the point is stop bashing other people stop stop telling people that their bike is shit because it weighs eight kilos or eight and a half kilos, or nine kilos, or seven kilos, or whatever the weight is. Like, there is a lot of elitism in cycle, and us being obsessed with how much stuff weighs, and pushing that that idea onto other people is bad for getting more people riding bikes. In fact, probably Nick Vieri, our bike mechanic, Nick Vieri, he's done loads of stuff with us on video. We ride bikes and hang out with him. He is, the, without a doubt, the first person who is performance focused, like he used to be a proper, proper bike racer back in the day. And he's the first person I've ever come across that would just like loll at me when I would be like, oh yeah, how much does that weigh? Or how much is that saddle? Yeah, he doesn't and, give it and like, does he? And like he will intentionally load up his gravel bike with like 20 kilos of, of Snickers bars and then just like, 
find it hilarious that he can just still ride anything that you ride on whatever bike you've got kind mm, of thing. Mm, mm. Like, well, uh, yeah, if you're fit, if you're the fittest on the ride, you're still the fastest on the ride. If you are focused on performance, obviously some people are, uh, especially triathletes. I know triathletes get a lot of stick, um, but a lot of triathletes are specifically looking at performance because they're essentially time trying against themselves. Uh, what is a better thing to consider than bike weight? Aero. Your own fitness. Fueling. Fueling. Hydration, all of that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't mean, and when I say aero, it doesn't just mean spending shit tons of money on really expensive aero gear. It's just like the basic things make a big difference. What do you do so like a basic thing? Narrow bars. Move your shifters in. Wearing a skin suit instead of a jersey and shorts. That's a huge difference. Like Helmet huge makes difference. a huge difference. Helmet. Tape up the thingies. Aero socks. Aero shoe covers. All of that makes a massive difference, especially in TTs and stuff. But then... Wait, wait, wait. I have, I have, to, I have to qualify this. It doesn't make a massive difference. It does make a noticeable difference. It's not massive to the extent that like you're going to be like, I am now winning, but you will definitely notice time coming off for the same amount of effort. Um, We're exaggerating the math. math. I, I, I confidently can say most people, if you went from baggy, not baggy, but like normal jersey and shorts, normal bike without deep wheels, normal helmet, normal position, versus skin suit, aero socks, taped up helmet, you know, all the aero gear, switch in shifters, you can feel how much faster it is. And that is true. I No, I agree with you. But you want to do, do all of agree with that. Things. Yeah, it, it's... It's like, whoa, I'm faster. But this yes. feels... Feel, feel, but yeah. only, only just, but it does feel different. And you're just like, wow, this is a big, big difference. Yeah. But and you guys you will show how much the difference, difference like aerodynamics is, I think. Like, it, <laughs> but I still will say, from my experience of doing triathlons, racing, starting from no fitness and then getting to like a decent amount of fitness, mm. the most easy thing and most significant thing to improve is your fitness not easy for everybody some people have reached the limit and then other things start becoming a lot more important to get that last few percent i'm right. pretty certain most people haven't reached their, their limit of fitness maybe people maybe i hang around with you people. hang around with the wrong yeah. people yeah <laughs> like elite cyclists yeah okay if you hang around with elite, it's like like elite cyclists then they probably are close yeah. to the limit <laughs> for your club rider there's a lot that can be done with the same amount of time you have you can be a lot more efficient with your training. A lot of people yeah. don't optimize that, but they. But then, if you could just buy the gains, which you can, in some cases, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, I think this is why people have stick with triathletes because that that is without a doubt the, the triathlete, they the track on space. We well, you, you can you absolutely can you can buy a wet a, a wet suit a wet suit that is really fast and you will be faster on the swim. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can buy a TT bike. What are the shoes with carbon inside? Oh, this yeah for for rent. That sounds like doping. That's good. It is weird. It does feel like it's going to be made legal because essentially the idea is that the the carbon sole propels you. So that feels like somehow, but it's not. It's not like a spring, is what I was told in Kona. It's more about how it like dampens and does something. It's not. It's not like springy. It's not like cheating. It's like cheating. No, it's not like saying spring legs. You know how didn't that guy get in trouble in the paras? Oh, let's not, we're, no, we're, we're going away. No, yeah, <laughs> let, let, we'll, we'll, we'll just stay away from that. Is the price of bikes to blame for the obsession for weight? So the idea that manufacturers need to constantly increase, or they're constantly increasing the price of bikes, and one way that they can justify the more expensive one is that it is lighter than a cheaper one. Yeah, so using the bike weight in the marketing stuff yeah. is perhaps a bit misleading because it doesn't actually mean that much to people. Like in that specialised alley. It doesn't matter that much to people. One of the sales points of the new alley is that it's the lightest Super in light its class frame. at 1.4 kilos. Like, mm. it doesn't really mean anything, does but it? But I guess it's like, there's nothing, you can't stop them from doing that. It's like, oh, you, you I don't know, people want a light thing. It's, it's again, it's a quantifiable thing isn't it it's a quantifiable measure uh, the quantifiable side of it is is actually very interesting i've never really considered about considered it's that the only thing you can compare no one's going to a wind tunnel to test a bike and if the like i said earlier you can't test 
your bike against someone else's because as soon as you put a person on it then it completely changes all the reading so me sat on your bike might be more aero than you sat on your bike yeah depends on the shape of your body and the shape of your legs and all these things so there's literally no way to quantify anything it's the only comparable thing look how light my bike is look how light your bike is well i guess i guess it should be what we should actually be comparing as consumers is like comfort and enjoyment i guess the problem is that they're really they're subjective things aren't they they're yeah yeah, for yeah. well like i can tell um oh you don't mind me saying this on a descent i descend a lot faster than you i can tell the handling of a bike is good or bad quite quickly whereas you we had an argument about our uh, cyclocross bikes the other day and i'm like they're shit for people shit, shit for consumers unless you're riding cyclocross they're shit for everything except for riding cyclocross on because they're really short they're really twitchy they're brilliant for handling at low speed but on a uh descent especially around here if i was in the pennines descending on a cyclocross bike it's like it just doesn't ride nice all, a traditional cyclocross bike. All, all of the reasons you don't like cyclocross bikes, I love. You like them. <laughs> In traffic, they're great. They kind of are. Yeah. But um, some people will notice that. Some people won't. Some people will like different things. Again, yeah, subjective. Um, do people expect a 1,000 plus bike to be sub 8, kilo, eight kilos to justify the cost? Ultimately... I don't even know. I haven't, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about what people expect from a bike anymore. I think I, just... I was I was out of the loop. I was not really cycling that much when we made the transition from rim to disc. It kind of happened while I was doing other stuff. And then bikes obviously got heavier. But I've come back, you know, a, a couple of years after that, and there's disc brakes everywhere. And I was very quickly... You know, I quickly bought into that and I was like, actually, these are really, really good. And then I started mountain biking. I was like, oh, of course, this is just all technology brought over from mountain biking. It, it's wicked. I, I actually think one of the things that consumers haven't yet caught up on is the fact that the industry has moved to tubeless, wide rims and disc brakes, yeah. which all weigh more than a traditional, you know, rim brake bike of 10 years ago. Yeah. So, so actually, people are still working on the weight parameters of there's people here going oh the bike industry is making everything heavy that's the that's what i get from some of the commenters yeah that's the that's what they're thinking i would say from my experience of riding quite a lot of bikes it's just it just shouldn't be something we even think about no i really i would rather have a heavy bike with tubeless discs and um what was the other thing <laughs> Uh, wide rims. Wide rims. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was comfortable. Yeah, that was comfortable. Yeah, for yeah. sure. But then uh, maybe I'm in a different stage of my riding career. Yeah. Now. I definitely, when I used to race, I was definitely willing to put up with discomfort for performance. Oh, for sure. Um, All pros are. Yeah. Ultimately, uh, I think we are, as consumers, obsessed with the weight of bikes. And I wish that we could stop weighing everything that we do on Jimmy Media and Cade Media <laughs> and people wouldn't get unbelievably upset. Mate, that's like 30 seconds of precious video time. That's I, right away. I will be, right I'll be happy. The time where we get to make videos about bikes that doesn't ever include weight will signal to me that, I mean, I, that, I that like, we've moved. I want to know. I want to know. You want to know? Yeah. Why? Interesting. I personally find it interesting. Like putting all these things on a thing makes it this weight. Ooh. What's it? <laughs> and on that mo note, on that note, we, will, we will move on. <laughs> listeners take over. This is the part where we throw it over to the listeners to send in your questions, comments, and problems and stories. Problems and stories. Mm -hmm. Question from Matt. Uh, you, as in us. Yeah. Uh, we've been reviewing a lot of bikes lately. There must be loads in the studio now. There is. What do you do with them after you're finished filming? Currently, nothing. We've just got a studio full of bikes. And we have not come to a... We don't have an answer. We think we've got a solution. We've talked about it a lot. But we haven't quite worked it out. We're definitely going to run out of space. We definitely want to do we have, something... We have run out of space. ...charitable with them. Um... But yeah, we need to figure that out, don't we? We do need to work it out. Yep. Uh, so the answer to that question is 
nothing. If you have suggestions, if you have suggestions of what we should do with all the bikes we now have, other than give them to you, let us know in the comment section down below. Uh, and if there isn't a comment section, email us. <laughs> Uh, the next one is a question from Mark, a.k.a. Worthy. Maybe his surname's Worthington. Maybe it's Mark Worthington. Maybe. Just exposed uh, him. Oh, it's bold. Uh, just wanted to ask what the strangest, funniest, or most, most unusual thing you've seen whilst you've been outside. I've seen some pretty mad stuff, but I have to admit, <laughs> what happened to you and me? on one of the first videos back when I came back from America and we went for a ride together. Because I, we... I, I can't remember, what was it? A seagull. Oh! oh Which you've deleted from your brain because it traumatized you. It was very strange. So I was... Um, we were filming a video about a mountain bike and something else in the Pennines and we were on a bike ride together. It was, it was the, it was the electric bike. bike. The, no, switch bike. It was the switch. It was, it was the switch. Yeah, yes. we were on the switch yeah, bike. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and we were out riding in the middle of nowhere, farmland in the Pennines, mm. around one of the reservoirs. It was, it was, we were going out and back. Yeah. And we rode past a seagull that wasn't flying. It was injured by the side of the road. And you stopped very, very quickly. Yeah. And you were like, I've be, I've come across quite a few keep injured, injured bird, birds keep finding injured birds mm. and by that i thought like you know what to do but no you just stopped and went do you remember the now what do we do do you remember the advice you gave me first of all what was it i don't i don't think i should even say it was it kill it you said stamp on it well you, and i said that sounds like i said like, yeah. you can fucking come here and stamp on it yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it was really injured so not just for fun because it was yeah the, it's it really was like hanging on yeah yeah it was not, and it was, it was in a puddle way. it was in a puddle we stood there for a minute, wondering what to do. And then uh, as a tiny speck in the distance, there was a, a vehicle coming towards us. And it was one of those buggies. There was like a farm little, buggy thing yeah, too. With a farmer inside driving it. He didn't have a local accent. Maybe he just roams around. Maybe. He pulled over. I apologized to him for not knowing how to neck a bird because I assumed the farmer would just be used to like, I don't know, dealing with injured animals. Um, he then asked us if we were squeam squeamish and then immediately pulled out his shotgun and shot it with both of us about half a meter from him. And I'm not even joking. It was the loudest noise. My ears are still ringing. It was, it was like painfully loud. Yeah. I was, I was, it, I think it was so loud. It was like shocking. Yeah. I'm actually quite glad that the, the birds put out of his misery because it was like, it was definitely like. You know, it, it was like tripping over its own wing. It was that knackered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was a good thing. But also, uh, quite a sh Probably shot. illegal. That must be illegal. Weird? Yeah. Can you? Are you allowed to shoot shotgun shotguns on public roads? Probably not. In this country? The, the, I like most that we then rode away and we didn't speak for about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were like, did that really just happen? Processing the ringing yeah. in our ears. Yeah. That was quite peculiar. That is actually really odd, isn't it? That was weird. That was weird. Have we got any others? I, I can't think of any. I was desensitized. I, I was desensitized because I've just done the ride across America yeah. with Justin. And what, a lot of what, weird stuff happened there. What was one of the weird things that happened riding across America? There must have been a couple. His wheelchair breaking and then us being picked weird. up by the side of the road by a man who'd looked for us for two days. <laughs> much to his wife's dismay. Chunked us in his truck, drove us to a top secret army base, and then we welded his wheelchair back together, or his mate did. That was that was pretty wild. That's a very that is a very weird story. Yeah, but just, no seagulls got shot. Yeah, that is weird. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, next question from David. Uh, Hi guys, love your videos and the addition of Jimmy to the channel. Thank you very Yay. much, David. Uh, it looks like you get on well and you really complement each other on screen. We don't. Um, what we don't get on well or we don't complement each other. Uh, first one. Oh, okay. Uh, What's it really like working with your friend? Do you ever argue? Well, we're not friends for a start. Um, you, so it's, it's quite easy when, when you, you don't care about the other person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Strictly business. Um, uh, jokes aside, uh, well, we've known each other for ages now. Mm. Uh, we've always done work together. Yeah. Just not for the same I, company. I think people that actually know us off camera probably don't like it when we hang out 
because we end up laughing and talking about very weird things. I'm surprised this podcast hasn't gone off into some <laughs> mad we have, sort of... It's because we have a producer keeping us on track. Yeah, she's looking at us, she tells us, she <laughs> stares at us and goes... In, in fact, going? on numerous occasions, people have commented on how we're having a conversation. They'll like go to the bar and get a drink or go to, a to, to go to the toilet or something, come back. And then like they can't believe how far we've gone in our conversation because yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. we've gone from like talking about water bottles to like flying a rocket to the moon mm. to like see if a bike can be ridden on the moon or something creative fusion fusion but do we argue um we definitely are both very comfortable debating stuff yeah yeah and we regularly have very opposite opinions mm. but i don't i wouldn't say we argue i'd say we just have opinions yeah and we're, we're quite comfortable that we both have different opinions like jimmy likes his pedals so loose that you can basically take your foot out of them like this. And you like your pedals so tight that it snaps my leg off every time I try and get out of them. Yep. <laughs> Who's right? Probably neither of us. Someone, probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah, good. yeah it would. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I'd say, I'd say it's pretty good. Yeah, it's good so far. Yeah. We should carry on. Next. We should do an, an episode two of the podcast. <laughs> Uh, the next thing is a story from James Tully. How, how, how's your reading, Francis? Would you like to read this one? Well, because it's really long. Well, it, it is longish, but it's a good story. I've read it already. My name is James. I'm an Irish man who likes to cycle. Oh, I'm currently should, cycling do it across in the accent. US. Don't do it in Irish accent. From New York to Los Angeles. Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm documenting my trip on Instagram and also do a podcast. I've got plenty of stories from the road. One that springs to mind is about a week ago, I got a flat tire on the Katie Trail. I got help from some guys passing. They ended up pumping up my tire too much and it blew up. Ruined. Over the next two days, I had to walk my bike a total of 38K. Pushing the bike the whole way fully loaded in the heat. Would not recommend. You didn't have a spare tire. Tire? Do you Why wouldn't you have a spare tire? You carry a spare tire? I carry two spare tires all the time when I'm bikepacking, always. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, there you go. That's why I had a 50 kilo bike. <laughs> <laughs> I had to carry three extra for Justin. Two extra tires? Yeah. Mouses. Yeah, because he's got three. Tricycle. Handbike. My Instagram is Tully Travels underscore official, and the podcast is called the same. Check them out. I do daily updates and do a dance from time to time and make it as fun as possible. Does a dance? I, I've got a lot. I would say check him out. Time. Send this man some new tires. <laughs> uh, nice. Seriously, take a spare tire. It's not on it. Like, yeah, it makes your bike heavier, but <laughs> it's, it's definitely easier riding a bike that's 300 grams heavy. How much, how much does a tire weigh? 200 grams. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not, not even that much than walking it for 38k but i've never even walked 38k i'll probably do that in a year that is a long way isn't it that's a long way fair play to you james um that is a very long walk <laughs> really are you walking across the usa <laughs> you know what while i was cycling across australia with chris years ago there was a man wheelbarrow wing ring wheelbarrow ring i can't say it Wheel wheelbarrow wing across Australia. Was he in the wheelbarrow? No. He was pushing He was wheelbarrow. pushing his stuff in a wheelbarrow. It's just his way of carrying all of his things. Wow. And that isn't... The we didn't see him. That should have we been... We wanted to. That should have been an entry in the weirdest things you've seen whilst... Oh, you you didn't see him. We didn't see him. The weirdest things you didn't see while cycling. Which is surprising. It's surprising because there's only one road. What? In Australia? He must have like... Swung Where did he go? A piss. <laughs> While we were going past, <laughs> teleported around each other. Yeah, I actually did that to vegan cyclist. He came out to find us when we were near his house once. T shout out to Tyler, a vegan cyclist. We were meeting him at his house and he rode out into Yosemite. There's only one road. So he was guaranteed <laughs> to intercept us and he was going to have a lovely ride back to his house. And then we teleported around him. And then he ended up riding like an extra 20 miles into Yosemite. Never found us. Talked to loads of people. A, a lady drove back came past us and was like, there's a guy looking for two pe uh, three people on bikes. Is it you? And we were like, oh, how have we missed him? And it turns out we went into like a uh, gravelly trail by accident. So just at the wrong time, he would have come past us. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's what we were going to do. 
And on that note, if you have any questions or stories for us, send them to Wild Ones Podcast at cademedia.co.uk and we might read them out on the next show. Uh, the next section is called Rate My Ride. We thought it'd be fun to see what you guys are riding, so we've asked listeners to send us some photos of their bikes and we're going to rate them. Um, if I you're... thought it was Roast My Ride. I'm very disappointed. Well, it can be if you want it to be. I will Cause be. Because roasting is part of rating. Every single one. Um, if you are listening on Spotify or another pop player, if you are listening on Spotify or another podcast platform, click into the show notes and you'll find link to the pictures of the bikes. The first one is Rich Mitch, cycling famous Rich Mitch. He's a, Mi- he's a cartoonist and he makes cartoons. That's what cartoonists do. <laughs> he draws cartoons. He also illustrates and other is, mediums of art. Is he? <laughs> And what? <laughs> is he an illustrator or a cartoonist? I mean, well, a, a cartoon is a type of illustration, isn't it? <laughs> Rich Mitch, what are you? He's, he's a drawer of things <laughs> um, and has a great passion for cycling. We, we both know him. Loads of people know him in the cycling. If you, if you look him up, you'll almost certainly recognise his little illustrations because everyone's got a, a Rich Mitch mug with like Marco Pantani on it or something Some like people's that. profile pictures on social media. Uh, made by Rich Mitch. The, yeah, that's true. Rich including his own. Time. They're really cool. Uh, so, Rich Mitch submitted um, a bike that he built. I'm going to have a look. Yeah, pull up the picture. Woo, 26er. Uh, whilst you pull it up, I will read what he said. So, Rich says, This bike is a giant Ledoga from 1991. It's had a life. It was originally sold by EJ Barnes in Westwood Groves, London. There's a sticker on the down tube. The shop was home to the Archer CC, the first club of a young Sir Bradley Wiggins. Maybe it was Bradley Wiggins' bike. Ooh. Uh, it cost him £10. Um, uh, I was dropping some stuff down at the tip one weekend and noticed they had a shop. I glanced across as I was driving by and did a double take. Look at all those bikes. Uh, that's really cool, actually. So, that, so at the tip... They're basically selling stuff, which presumably then goes to the council to do things like clean up, fly tippers and Potholes. things. Potholes. Potholes. So recycling the stuff that they're getting in the tip and selling on. So we bought it for 10 quid from the tip. Um, I spanned the car around for a look. The giant stood out to me straight away. Uh, it was by far the best of the bunch, but it was hidden under more modern bike-shaped objects. Very Francis Cade quote that. Um, so you had to know what you were looking for to grab it. So a week later, after a bit of my usual thinking, I went back, paid my tenner, and now it's ready to be overhauled and brought back to life. Um, I'm pretty sure he said that he spent a total of £150 on it. Um, I was about to ask that. That's, I mean, total price. That's a, that's fucking sick. Assuming... That's a cool looking bike. Assuming the frame is not written off in some way which it probably isn't because it's going to be steel that is a very very cool bike very cool um is it it's like a pinky red color um there's tw- there'll be 26 yeah, wheels 26. Like mud guards one by the only thing i don't like about it is the angle of the saddle to me that reeks of discomfort um but i'm sure it works for rich uh i think that is unbelievably cool that is the kind of bike i would love just to like bosh around on commutes and mm. sling around town we should get two we should get two 26s for the studio that me and you just ride around R- around the studio yeah because it's quite big Sh- do we do we need like, like what well, oh, we need to go over there to get water we can just get on the bikes from in here go over there instead of using the park tool stool it, it is, we don't it, want to stand up it's, anytime it's like 10 meters otherwise it's i'll not up. very far no it's far 10 meters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's why I've never walked 38k. 38K. I'm careful to never do that. 38k and 10 meters are very different things, Francis. No, but it adds up. <laughs> if you do it 38 Next bike. 100 times. Next bike. <laughs> oh, we've got to rate it. Well, wow. we haven't got a system. So what should we rate it? Oh, we need to uh, make this now. One to five. Oh, it's got a Cold Dark North sticker on it. Shout out to Tobes. Plus one point. Cold Dark North. Uh, surely it's out of 10. Out of 10. Yeah. Um, I am going to give that... 9.5 out of 10. The 0.5 is only due to the uh, saddle angle that makes me a little bit scared for certain parts of my anatomy. Yeah, I like it's got full mud guards as well. That is a minimum. That's bike. worth an extra half. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, no. 9.5, I'm in agreement. Oh, we're pretty. agreeing. Mm-hmm. There we go. We rarely do. All right, next one. Close. Uh, would you like to read the next one? This is Phil's Mash All Road Vintage Gravel Bike. Cool. Phil says, 
Hi, Jimmy and Francis. Last year, I started cycling again after not touching my bike since my teenage years and started building a fixed gear track bike. While I really liked it, it was less than ideal for gravel. So I decided to build something more versatile with larger tire clearance. I saw the mash all road frame and fell in love with it. So I decided to build an all mechanical light gravel bike, but wanted it to look like a vintage road bike with silver components. Where are you going to find silver components? That aren't Kempag. I know where. I, before looking at the picture, has he managed to get that group set? How is he? How did you say? Has he? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I've lost the picture. Yeah. It's GRX. He's got the, the shiny silver chrome looking GRX, which was a limited run that they only sold to frame builders who are like indie frame builders. Right. But I imagine it ended up on the internet as well. That's pretty neat. Yeah. But uh, Shimano intended for it to only be for that. So it's not, it's, is that right? It's good. It's got sensor shifters on it. The spec's good. I like it. Wait. What? What? Is the what? What are you struggling with, Francis? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm not. And I'm now looking at the thing. Okay, so he's only got the rear mech from that. Yeah, from the GRX. Yeah, it's it's, like got, a, it's a sensor made. It's the it's hell? it's a Franken build that's absolutely fantastic. Thirty-five mil tires. Where'd you get? The, where'd you get the sensor pro shifters from? Well, well, AliExpress, obviously. Well, ask Phil. 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 We've got a question for you. Where'd you get those from? That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Very nice. It's not very good roast, is it? No, we're not doing very good. I, I actually think that bike is fantastic. And I think what's really interesting about it is he has absolutely smashed his own brief. It legit looks like a track bike, but it absolutely isn't a track is bike. It's a track bike at all. They, like, the, my fir when I first saw it, I was like, oh, it's a track bike. And I'm like, oh, no, it's not. It's got a massive cassette on it. Yeah, handlebars are in nice shape. I don't like the gold chain ring, but that's the only uh, thing that I would change. I'm not a fan of the tape. I would change the chain ring and the tape. You're very doing black tape, aren't you? Yeah, I'm always black tape. Yeah. Mm. I do like the silver. I've tried to experiment before. It always goes badly. Um, oh, he's done, like, gold chain ring, but gold... Uh, valve caps. Blue calipers. Are they Paul calipers? Oh. That's that's a bit of bling, that. Expensive mechanical discs. That is a bit of bling. I don't know how good they're going to be, but that's a bit of bling. But that's that's one of the examples of ex like mm. good and well-functioning mechanical discs. I've never that used them. Like they're... They look great. All, I would like to. I would like to great. build. I'd like to do a build with those. I'd like to do a build with those. The saddle angle is what I would expect, um, so I'm not going to knock him down for that. Um, time to race it. You first. Eight. Why? Because it's a very nice looking bike, but I don't like the chainring. I'm going to give it one out of ten. Because I feel like we need to give people... I'm only joking. It's actually a great bike. I was just thinking, you know, we need to roast something, surely. Uh, I'm going to give it 7 out of 10. Ride slow. Uh, I whenever. You know, actually, do you know what? You're right. 8 out of 10 is, is where it is. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to agree with you on that one. 8 out of 10. It's nearly a 10 out of 10 bike. Mm -hmm. It's just a couple of colour things, and then I would give it 10 out of 10. Oh, it looks amazing. SPDs, like SPD mm, off-road pedals of some sort, they're very blurry. With a platform on, very versatile. It's a good bike. Yeah, good bike. Come on, let's have a shit bike. Well done. What's next? Well done, Phil. Tom's Tarmac Tora. The alliteration, already worth one point. <laughs> Tom says, I haven't looked at it yet. Tom says, starting on June the 1st, I plan to cycle the entire route of the 1951 Tour de France to raise m money for Prostate Cancer UK. I'm doing this in memory of my dad, who he lost to prostate cancer 10 years ago. I chose the route from 1951 as it's the year of his dad's birth. That tour was 4,690k over 26 days, and I'll be riding it as the pros did, a stage a day. On this fully loaded 
specialised tarmac as the pitcher got bags on it. I'll be starting in Metz on June the 1st and finishing at the Arc de Triomphe in Paris on the 26th. I'm forty year I'm a forty year old amateur cyclist and definitely not an elite athlete, so this will be a huge challenge for me, but I want to help raise awareness about this terrible disease and highlight the amazing research and scientific breakthroughs that are funded by Prostate Cancer UK. This isn't an organized event. I hope to be joined by a few friends on some of the stages, but for the most part it will just be me and my bike, solo and unsupported. You can follow me on my Instagram at L underscore tour underscore de underscore. Tom, Le Tour de Tom. First things first, Tom, you're a legend. That is going to be an epic ride, and it's obviously a, an amazing cause that you're doing it for. Uh, so, bike shredding aside, good on you. I hope you get loads of support. Um, on to the bike. Specialised tarmac. You know what? I, I like... <gasps> I like what? You're going to improve with this. What? Look at, look at the, fr the fork. What's he got attached to the fork? Spare tire. It's spare tire. Uh, smart man. <laughs> smart man. He's got tubes taped to <laughs> tubes taped to the top tube and the seat tube. At least one tire taped to the to the fork. This is a very well prepared bike. Yep, great. I like uh, race bike with stuff on it. It's cool. Yeah. And I people a lot. Like often I'll do videos where I have my race bike. I basically only have race bikes here. We've got a couple of Cade Media bikes. My ones at home are just race bikes I used to race. That's what I'm used to riding. That's why I like riding out on the lanes. When I post a picture or make a video of my bike with bags on it, people are like, oh, why aren't you using touring setup and this and that? It's like, because I haven't got one of those bikes. So I like the fact this is a high-end bike with bags on. It, it looks... Because it's what you have. It looks mega versatile. Yeah. It's got like... He's clearly thought about all of the spares he might need on that trip. I bet he's got a chain and things like that in those bags. It's relatively light considering the distance he's going. He's got aero bars on the front to give him more uh, different positions. Um, it's disc brake, which is just going to make it easier on his hands. It's... Is it DI2? No, it's Mechanical 105, which means he's going to be able to service it absolutely anywhere if something goes wrong. Easy. That is very well considered. My initial thoughts were it, he might benefit from some like some bigger, comfier tyres because it's a very long ride. Oh, pretty wide. But it's going to be very much a road ride. So it's going to be good. I think that's amazing. Yeah, if he's got the route all planned out and stuff. If you're going somewhere where you didn't really know, then maybe you want some bigger tyres. But it sounds like France has got good roads, isn't it? Yes. Be fine. Very nice. And uh, then when you finish... You have a great fast bike still. Yes. It's like, sorry, back to my argument about race bikes being used for bike packing. The bags are great now. You can get loads of stuff that fits on race bikes, like all the bike packing bags instead of the touring bags. Mm -hmm. There's a guy called Boru who works for Hearn Hill or worked for Hearn Hill Velodrome. He's riding around the world at the moment. Or the whole way. He's been away for a the year. Whole world. Coming up to the whole world. He's going every, all the way around. around. He's going, well, it's kind that, of like a wiggly route. The, when he's riding all around the world, yeah. he's going all around the world. All the way around. Oh, okay, cool. All around. Yeah. Uh, he has been, he's coming up to a year of riding now. But in the places that he stops, he's been in Malaysia for a bit. And then he's taking the bags off the bikes. He takes his bags off the bike. And goes for a ride. And goes for a ride. And or a race. It. He won a race the other day. No. Yeah. Because he's got his... High-end bike, which he knows it fits him. He knows he's comfortable on. He knows he can do a fun, fast ride on it. Whereas if you were on like, I don't know, if you're on a touring bike and you, that's not usually your thing and you wanted to go on a fast ride mm -hmm. for whatever reason, you know, he's met up with the guys from the local bike shop and he can have a wicked time. I, I've actually just discovered one negative. What's that? I think, uh, I'm pretty certain that's a road pedal. I think an SPD with an SPD shoe would be more appropriate. Yeah, no, I agree. Because, especially if he's unsupported, He's going to be stopping off at shops and he's going to have to do some walking around on his own. He's just going to be more comfortable and passive. Pe yeah, no, I 100% agree. I've might... taken road pedals on trips before, which I thought were just going to be road like Spain yeah. with Chris. And then it was annoying. Yeah. Because you, you, there's inevitably parts where you have to walk. And where even if it's just into shops and stuff, it's just a pain in the ass, isn't it? Yeah. Nothing wrong with SPDs. But if you don't have SPDs and this is the gear you've got, you're probably not going to go and spend £100 on shoes. So. Probably more if you want to make sure you're comfortable for something like that. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Right. So let's rate it. I'm going to go for... No, you're going to go first. I'll go second. I know. I've already decided my rating now. I'm going for eight out of ten. That's boring, isn't it? 
I wanted to really... Emily, next next time. No, they're all good. Get some naughty bikes. I'm going to rate this 10 out of 10. Ooh. Because he's well prepared and it's a very good cause. Oh, yeah. So it makes you look like a dick now. Yeah, it? I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about the charity bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that is it for Rate My Ride. Uh, if you'd like us to rate your ride, email us, a, email us a photo along with your name to wild ones podcast at cademedia.co.uk now time for some good news this is part of the show where we celebrate the awesome and positive things going on in the cycling community technically this isn't cycling <laughs> sort of cyclist uh not exactly he does cycle so basically right so once upon a time many moons ago i was in a band the front man of that band so this is back when i lived in cardiff i grew up in cardiff Front man of the band, Heard Paul. Big deal in Cardiff. I was a big deal in Cardiff once upon a time. Um, the front man, Paul, uh, post being a legendary rock front man, became a mental health nurse and has been working in the NHS for about a decade now as a mental health nurse. Uh, he has very recently set up a not-for-profit organisation in South Wales, more specifically the Vale of Morgan and Barry Island, uh, where they famously film Gavin and Stacey. Um, the not-for-profit he has set up is called Stand Tall Wales and what they do, and I absolutely love it, um, they are encouraging men in the region because there's an obscenely high suicide rate in men, specifically in South Wales. Um, so they are doing eight-week courses where once a week you go for a session where you learn from a professional weightlifter, Olympic weightlifting in a group. And then after the weightlifting session, they then have um, like a facilitated workshop where they talk about mental health and techniques for dealing with it. So it's an eight week course for people that are struggling with their mental health, that they get to do exercise, bond with some people, um, do some stuff they've perhaps never done before and actually learn some tools uh, to deal with mental health um, or their mental health. And what they're finding from the few sessions that they've done thus far is the groups of people that are forming are then staying together and they're then helping each other and you know staying going to the gym and things like that um the reason i want to talk about this is i want as many people to donate to stand tall wales as possible so they can keep running these sessions helping people as or as many people as they can going forward uh on their website standtallwales.co.uk there's a section where you can donate literally it you don't even need to donate much if you can't. Uh, it costs about a thousand pounds for every eight week session. The two guys involved in it, Paul, I don't actually know the name of the other guy. Um, they're both prof like he's a medical, well, Paul's a medical professional. The other guy's a, a, a lifting professional. They're not taking sal like big salaries. They're literally just covering themselves with living wage, plus then having to rent all of the spaces that they're doing it. So they're trying to keep it as lean as possible because they want to help people. And I think this as a format is incredible and I want it to do well because I want, I want to see this sort of thing all over the country. This is the sort of stuff that like helps, like legitimately helps people and I think it should just be everywhere. Mm. And it continues to help people even yeah. past the event. That's well, that, cool. that's the whole point of it. It isn't just a, it's, it's, it's something that gives people tools potentially for the rest of their life to be able to deal with things that perhaps in the past they haven't been able to deal with. And as we all know, you know, like mental health is, is an ongoing thing that we have to work on. Um, I think what these guys are doing is absolutely phenomenal. I, I, I love Paul. I think he's amazing. They actually recently walked. They were trying to raise funds, again, for the, for the same reason. They walked from the top of Penavan in the Brecon Beacons to the top of Sno Snowdonia in North Wales. And it was like... 38k. Uh, <laughs> it was, I think, 110 miles and they did it over about three days, just walked the whole thing. So basically up a massive mountain, down a massive mountain, to another massive mountain and up that. Um, and they managed to raise about £1,000, which gets another eight-week course blocked in. So good on you, Paul. Nice work. If you can donate, please do so. Links in the thing. <laughs> links, links are wherever we can work out where they need to go. <laughs> It's a work um, in progress, guys. <laughs> That's the end. First ever podcast. Hey! Hey! If you want to uh, see more of these, then subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube to the Cade Media channel. Or listen to it. Don't forget. Or listen to it. 
Oh, because did I say watching? Yeah. I'm so used to that. <laughs> if you're going to listen to this, then you can find this podcast in all your normal podcast locations like Spotify and iTunes um, everywhere. I don't know any of the others, but there's a lot of them. Nah, that's why we're not in charge of that bit. Emily's on it. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. See you guys next time. <laughs> we definitely need a theme song, don't we?